Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Good morning, everyone. I was pleased that Anne-Marie didn't block me <laughs> after trying to phone her so many times. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do in the time that I've got with you is talk about what I've been trying to do in order to introduce uh, the Lumina tool to the uh, National Health Service. I'm going to be presenting some research that I've been leading on. This presentation that you're about to see, I've now presented it to most of the country. Uh, Louise, you've been in one of the sessions that I've uh, presented this at. I've actually now just got one region left, uh, which is central London, uh, which is October, uh, and Marie, and that will then be every region across the country for health uh, that I've been able to make this presentation at. Um, before I, I go on, I should say thank you to Aileen. It was when I was doing my master's in business psychology at uh, Westminster that I met Aileen. Aileen uh, introduced us to the tool, then introduced us to Stuart, and then introduced us to Anne-Marie. So thank you very much, Aileen, uh, for that. So this is a photo of the seventh uh, lunch, I think it's the seventh lunch uh, that we've had. Seven years ago, I uh, started to do a lunch for executive uh, women uh, at the House of Lords. Uh, it was done uh, to really do something to help uh, what the government is trying to do in terms of raising the profile of women um, on boards. And there was about 100 at the lunch that we've just had. Uh, many of the faces that you see are from the National Health Service. Uh, you can probably see Louise in there uh, somewhere. And uh, it's a really uh, good and useful lunch to be able to promote uh, diversity in that way and, uh, and context. And there you go, there's myself, uh, Louise and Anne-Marie there at, at, the same, uh, at the same event. Uh, so some context and background. Uh, Louise has already given some background in terms of the uh, National Health Service. I'll give a little bit more as we, as we go along. Maybe a good place to start is uh, here. I've been really privileged to serve as a non-executive director in the health service up until quite recently. I served for six years uh, on the board of a large uh, hospital uh, trust. If you're looking at the picture and you're not quite sure where I am, I'm third in from the left-hand side. <laughs> <laughs> so th this experience was really good for me because it helped me understand health. I thought I understood how the um, UK NHS system worked and I realised when I joined the board that actually I had no idea whatsoever. And it took me about 18 months uh, for, about, for the penny to drop of how it all works, how the different parts of the system uh, come together and, and work. So, it was a, a great opportunity. Uh, this is um, William Hunt. And the reason I've put this uh, picture up is because back in the 1700s, uh, he was very well known as being someone who helped move uh, what was happening in medicine from butchery, if you like, to more of a science. Uh, very well known for being able to diagnose conditions and diseases, and in doing so even gave himself some uh, diseases to help him think through uh, what appropriate remedies were. And the reason I start uh, my presentation as I go around the country presenting to health um, with this image is because uh, it's linked to the research that I've been carrying out, which is about the topic of mediation and organisation diagnosis. And this seems to resonate well um, as I present to health colleagues uh, around the country. So a little bit more to what Louisa has already said. Uh, in this country, uh, the NHS is now 70 years old. Uh, those who live here will uh, have recognized some of the celebrations that are currently going on uh, for our health uh, service. Huge employer. Uh, in the top five around the world, one point, so around 1.5 million uh, people uh, with an annual 
budget of 116 or 117 uh, billion pounds. So massive uh, as an organization. I present uh, this model, uh, the VUCA model, to try and put it into context around what's happening culturally um, in the health service. To explain uh, the boxes, uh, lots of volatility. The statement that you see in there, uh, who's to blame, uh, give us a name, was given to me by someone who runs a clinical commissioning group. And uh, as a result of the Lansley reforms, the bulk of the budget for NHS is held with clinical commissioning groups as they decide which providers are going to be receiving uh, different levels of revenue. And this quote was given by the chief exec as, as I was waiting for her in her office. She came in and said, sorry, I'm late, uh, Clive. I've just been on the phone with NHS England. Something's gone wrong, and this is what they said to me. Who's to blame? Give us a name so that we can find, find that out. So just quite, really quite, quite bizarre. Uncertainty around finance, lots of questions about the money. Will the money last? I remember as a, a member of the board having conversations year after year about how the board, uh, how the hospital could become more efficient by taking out 4% of money year after year after year. And that is just simply not not sustainable. Uh, Louise runs a trust which is very well run. Uh, a number of trusts that I step into last year had deficits of 20 million pounds, 30. Uh, I think the top was uh, about 57 million pounds. So we've got a real challenge and issue uh, now around um, finance. Uh, ambiguity, lots of organization change. Um, happening and something on uh, complexity, who's responsible for what. I was listening to a presentation the other day uh, which was given by someone at the Cheltenham uh, Science Festival. And as this person was given this uh, presentation, uh, they specialize in quantum mechanics as a, an element of physics. And he was just describing something that happens in quantum mechanics. And he used a word that I'd never heard before. He described uh, a, a, a word which is adibiotic. As he was explaining what that word means, it, in quantum mechanics, that means when you are trying to track the movement of something, that happens really slow. And it's almost difficult to track how it moves. And as he was given that uh, description, I thought, I know of an organization. <laughs> 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 that fits that description, <laughs> and I've, I've, I've taken that word uh, from him. Uh, a little bit more about the health uh, snapshot, maybe just one in the middle there. Right now, there are 40,000 nursing vacancies across uh, the country, and that number's remained static for some time, uh, for some time now. Uh, okay, at the top, uh, that figure comes from the National Audit Office. 34,000 people killed every year due to human error. I've put this in as uh, a link to the research. Um, when we are in conflict and difficulty, the impact can be that we make uh, mistakes. Uh, we think differently. Uh, our cognitive ability is impaired. Uh, but if I make a mistake, it's unlikely to be life-threatening. And if one of our physicians makes uh, a mistake, then it could be life-threatening. And I'll give a couple of examples a bit later on of some um, outliers that the research has found and, and indicated. So for those that may not be aware of the concept of um, mediation, um, much of my time, I'm a business psychologist specializing in employee and industrial relations. Much of my time is spent um, mediating disputes in a room with two or more people trying to help them find a solution to a problem uh, that they have. The process tends to run over one day, even if a dispute has been running on for uh, many years. And the focus is on interests as opposed to power or rights and helping people to understand what it is that they want and why they want it. Uh, so just yesterday, I was um, somewhere uh, where I had to take a, uh, a drive to help the 13 neurosurgeons 
who've been at war for the best part of uh, two or three uh, years. Lots of interpersonal issues, shouting, anger, bullying, uh, but also lots of organisation issues about a lack of bed space, theatres not being utilised to capacity, and a whole range of um, other things. Uh, last Friday, I was in a room with some obstetricians, gynaecologists, and midwives. Same thing, fallen out, interpersonal issues, lots of shouting um, going on, but also some organisation issues uh, affecting women um, such as level of uh, cesarean section births and other uh, aspects. Um, so pretty much for a couple of days a week, that's what I will be uh, doing, is trying to help um, our colleagues who are having difficulties with, um, with each other. Uh, there's a term that I use uh, to try and describe that mediation in a health uh, context. A couple I can pick upon, palliative care, which is pain relief. Uh, speak to anyone who's been embroiled in really difficult conflict and tension situations. They will describe to you the pain that they feel as a result of that. Sometimes it's physical pain. You might experience it in other ways, uh, such as losing sleep at night because you're ruminating and thinking about this person or the people that you have fallen out with. There's another term... Um, which is psychological trauma. Uh, that term was given to me by a junior doctor. I was in a room uh, with a group of nephrologists. Uh, nephrologists are kidney specialists, and they'd fallen out, again, some personal issues, but some um, uh, medical issues. Uh, there's a term called buttonholing, which is something that happens on your wrist. Um, and there's a procedure that can be carried out, which means that patients can be can dialyze at home rather than in the hospital. And there was lots of questions over whether that process was safe um, or not. But when we got to the end of the day uh, with the nephrologist, and there were about uh, 14 or 15 of them in the room, including a couple of transplant surgeons, about four of them. Uh, one of them was late to the session. He came in at about 11 o'clock and he apologized and he'd literally just finished transplanting a kidney. And it's just not the kind of thing you had heard of, you would, you would he, uh, hear of or you know, think about in your normal um, day of work. Um, but another of the trauma surgeons kept on walking out of the room, slamming the door, and then coming back in. He did that about four times um, throughout the day. One of the junior uh, consultants at the end of the day said, how on earth can you expect us to go back to work tomorrow after we've experienced such difficulty? And this had been running on for a good two years. And he used the term that he felt psychologically traumatized as a result of the anguish that he'd experienced with his uh, colleagues. So the research is that I've looked at 40 cases over a two-year period. And I've analyzed what uh, the data is saying about these cases. Uh, 40 cases, 2014 to 16 one or two cases outside of that period, 83% of the parties were clinicians, uh, and it's uh, qualitative research using uh, thematic analysis. And there are eight different themes um, that have come out, and I won't have time to go through each of them, but I'll just give you a flavor of what's come out. Uh, and here's an overview. Um, so a question for you before I show the first um, one, um, and the question is, how long you think it would take from the point at which there's a trigger, i.e. the conflict starts, someone sends an email, that email is seen to be inflammatory, or I step on your toe, um, how long you think it would take from that moment to a mediation happening? So a phone call comes through to an organization like mine, and someone's invited to come and help to sort that out. How long do you think that would take? Yes. One year. One year? Two years. Two years, yeah. OK. So you're quite close with two years. In total, it takes 19 months and two weeks, on average, for that to happen. The longest case, which was a group of um, gynecologists and obstetricians, uh, the dispute was running on for eight years uh, before there was a call to come in and try and solve it. Even though it was eight years, um, it was still able to be solved within just one day 
And I remember the medical director at the end of that day just shaking his head in disbelief that this dispute had been running on for so long, but could be resolved within um, just a day. Here are two portraits. The person on the left is a uh, consultant oncologist. The person on the right is a head and neck surgeon. The person on the right is about just over 40 years old as, as the surgeon. The person on the left is about 62, counting down his days to uh, retirement. Uh, the dispute here fell out, uh, th there was a dispute here where the colleagues fell out over um, a number of reasons. Um, the surgeon wanted to use other forms of um, treatment. So on the left, the person wanted to use chemotherapy and radiotherapy pretty much all the time. But the younger person, the surgeon on the right, uh, wanted to use um, surgery, um, either laser surgery or wanted to use robotics. The hospital had recently purchased a robot and he wanted to be able to um, use that for treatment. They specialize in something called oropharyngeal carcinoma and they look at how they can treat uh, what's referred to as T1, T2 or T3 tumors, which is the that those are just about the, the, um, the difference in size that tumours um, might be. The person on the left wants um, referral letters from the head and neck surgeon after he's seen a patient, and the surgeon is saying, I don't need to keep giving you um, <laughs> referral letters. So the discipline-driven aspect of the uh, consultant oncologist uh, is, coming out, is coming out. The surgeon is just saying, I just want to be able to get on with doing what I need to do. Uh, the person on the left is not from England. He's from Eastern Europe. And when there are occasions when the two of them are having a conversation with a patient, or maybe the patient's carer, sometimes the patient's carer or the patient is then looking at the surgeon to say, I didn't quite understand can you repeat what it is that your colleague is, is saying? So a whole range of issues. Uh, and having spent a day uh, with them, um, this is the first time that I had done this. We uh, did the Lumina tool, and this was the result. And having gone back to see them six weeks after and taken them through this, it was a bit of a light bulb moment as they read their portraits, and they could see what the differences were um, between them. Uh, this is the team portrait for, for a hospital board. Um, a, this is Derby Hospitals. And there's a real opportunity in health to do more work with boards using the team portraits. So you can see execs on the left, non-execs, and then the full team. Uh, and what's particularly important, I think, for boards is something that Louise has mentioned, which is where you can show these kinds of portraits using the overextended uh, persona. So the HR director for this trust was here yesterday, and rather than hear everything from me, I wonder whether we could hear what Neil, the HR director from this hospital, has to say about using Lumina. Uh, my name is Neil Pease, Dr. Neil Pease. I'm an executive director in the NHS, currently working at University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. Uh, in terms of board development, we, we first started using Lumina about two years ago, something like that, when uh, we started an organisational merger. So we really wanted to know, I suppose, how to get the most out of each other. We were quite a, a new board at the time. Uh, now, moving forward, we have just uh, undertaken the merger on the 1st of July, so now we're now university hospitals of. So we've almost got the past, what we did in the past, but now we're using Lumina currently to see what we can do as a new organisation uh, moving, moving forward. I think when you are on a board of a, a big organisation, we are now about 13,000 staff over seven sites. We turn over about £850 million, and I think it's... Uh, it can be quite high pressured. You, you're a very small group of people working together with 
a lot of responsibilities and how do we get the most out of each other. Um, I'm a particular fan of the overextended persona, so that's where I sp spend a lot of my time working. I think the NHS, as in any public sector in this country at the moment, is under a significant amount of pressure. I think it allows you to be a little bit more forgiving with, with people, with colleagues. I think understand that you know they are entering into that aspect of their, their persona in terms of being overextended. I think it helps you to look out for each other a little, a little bit more. Um, and I think from my own perspective, I think it allows you to develop alternative strategies that if you are under pressure, under stress, these are some of the behaviours that, that may, may come out. Um, I'm currently um, on call for our hospitals uh, this week and I think that you know if it's midnight and you're taking some pretty big decisions about the, the hospital, the organisation, um, you know, are you going to divert patients from one emergency department to another and you've got a lot of very worried people and you're getting pushed into that overextended persona, I think it helps you understand yourself and I think you give better decisions, I think you're a better person for, for understanding that. At our trust, probably the same as a lot of NHS organisations, we have a group called Responsible Officers Forum, so we look at problems with doctors that may be clinical problems where things have gone wrong clinically or what we see more and more of I would say probably 70% of the cases that we get referred to us uh, as a group um, our behavioral related either behavioral or nine times out of ten they're, they're based in relationship difficulties and sometimes you've got uh, cultural differences we you know with the NHS employees 1.2 million people we employ people from all over the world sometimes there's cultural issues uh, other times there is friction between different specialties who may not not agree on a course of treatment uh, but basically when you get a lot of very well educated people in one place under a lot of pressure there is there is disagreements and I use Lumina a lot to deal with doctors who are having who are having difficulties in managing their their relationships with colleagues strangely enough we don't get very many who have in relationships with with the patients they can be and you know the abject professional when dealing with patients but when they come into contact with each other it is a different uh, a different ball game so to speak so we use Lumina particularly to shine a light on those overextended personas and particularly when things start to go wrong from a behavioural perspective. So I know that the, there are other NHS organisations who, who are using Lumina in recruitment, but we're just starting to use it for, for medical consultant appointment panels. Um, because basically, if you're coming for a consultant role, you have the piece of paper that says you are qualified to go for that. So they have, they're all qualified to, to exactly the same level. So in terms of differentiating factors, there's not many to really to really go at. But what, we're used, what we've seen in the past with NHS consultant appointments is who you interview on the day, very nice person, fully qualified, then they start work and then sometimes we see problems start to arise and frequently it is from when the pressure is, is increased, uh, the level of work or the complexity of work increases, we start to see some, some problems appear and we're starting to use Lumina uh, as a tool to be used as part of that appointment process and it's given a really valuable insight for the interview panel as areas of opportunity in terms of questioning and some of the, some of the, the way how you would approach framing some the questions uh, to really gay, try to push a little bit, uh, definitely again on the overextended personas, but also how that person would fit as part of a bigger team, because healthcare is a, a hugely team orientated uh, profession and you work with so many different people from so many different specialties, uh, so it's really proving to be very advantageous with the, the appointment of senior clinicians. Okay, this seems to have, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, uh, because of time, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the eight. I'll just skip through a couple. Um, uh, this slide is about what the research has flushed out in relation to HR professionals. Um, are, are there any HR professionals in, in the room? Uh, some, okay. Uh, please forgive me for what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but the research has showed that HR professionals sometimes uh, mess things up. I'll give you an example of what I mean um, by, by that. Um, there was a case where in the, uh, let's say, the southwest of the country, I was invited to go and help two consultants that had fallen out. The reason why they had fallen out was because uh, they were from the hospital and they were helping out at a hospice. One was taken over from the other. In doing so, the consultant that had taken over uh, didn't read one of the patient's notes. Um, at the end of his bed. Mr. Smith, a 67-year-old man. She didn't read the notes, and as a result, she gave Mr. Smith morphine. Uh, if she had have read the notes, she would have seen that Mr. Smith was allergic to morphine. Shortly after Mr. Smith was given morphine, he wanted to go to the bathroom after about half an hour. In making his way, he tripped, he fell, uh, his teeth went through his lips. He had two black eyes. Uh, it's the lasting memory his family have of him. Uh, three days later, he was dead. Wind the clock forward two years, and I'm sitting in a room with the two consultants. And there were, a number, there were at least two things that stick out for me in my mind. Um, one was that the consultants that had been off, she had been suspended while an, inter uh, an investigation had taken place. Um, I'll never forget how she described to me how she, now two years on, had lost five stone in weight as a result of the anxiety and worry she had been experiencing in relation to this uh, event. The second thing that struck me was the story she told me, which was that she recognized that she'd made a mistake. While she was off, she reached out to uh, HR and said, I would like to talk to Mr. Smith's family. I made a mistake. I would like to apologize uh, to his family. Uh, and what do you think HR said? No, there's a process under where you cannot have any contact uh, with the family. And, and I understand it. I understand the pressure HR is under, needing to dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, maybe thinking about something that comes in, uh, in the future. Uh, but she was so sad uh, that she couldn't have that opportunity to engage with, um, uh, with the family of Mr. Smith. And there were a number of other similar cases or issues that came out in the research um, about uh, HR. Bullying and harassment, a specific area on clinical lead training. Um, I'm just going to go forward if I can here. Right, a couple of outliers, um, which is about the link that there is to conflict and other things happening in the hospital. Um, let me just pick up maybe on two of these. The figure you see there of 176%, um, there was a team of breast surgeons, four breast surgeons, four, three men, one woman that had fallen out. The woman kept on going off on sick leave. Um, but as a result of doing so, those elective patients that were coming in for surgery, um, it meant that their, their operations were being cancelled. So there's a term that's used in health, which is captured called patients cancelled on day of surgery. And for this hospital, for this department, it had gone up 176% as a result of the conflict and tension um, in that team. Uh, breast screening. Uh, there was a six-month backlog, and this was one of the cases outside of the research period, a six-month backlog. When the government changed the um, years, the timeline for breast screening, it was changed two years either side. There was a team experiencing so much tension and conflict that uh, there was a six-month backlog for them to be able to get through calling uh, women in uh, for, them to be, for them to be treated. And I can give you many other examples. So here are the uh, recommendations that I'm now presenting to, uh, to health. So let me come on to the uh, final slide. So where are we now? I've mentioned that I've uh, delivered this uh, presentation, uh, and this is the first part of the presentation that I'm delivering to health. Um, I've got enough time on the agenda as I go around the country to present the research, and then I'm, and then I'm presenting the Lumina tool. Uh, portraits are done beforehand. We're using the mat, we're using the cards, we're doing all of the exercises in a fairly short time, maybe four to five minutes or so, to give um, HR directors in the main a chance to feel what the tool uh, feels like. 
but I'm doing it that way around because having presented the research, um, the sense in the room is that they are engaging with someone who understands the health system. And my sense this way around uh, means that it works well. So what, what's some of the learning uh, for me at five points? One is, um, and what I would pass on to other practitioners trying to do something similar, similar. work hard on trying to know your sector well. Um, I think I know health very well. I've even been in theatre recently seeing a removal of cancer of the esophagus. I'd never been in theatre before, and it just was not how I anticipated it to, uh, to be. But I'm doing that for my own learning. Of course, the patient uh, had, to have, um, had to give me permission uh, to be able to do that. So I am very much drawing on my Dan Twerth stroke discipline-driven aspects in uh, doing that, working hard to identify uh, client needs. Uh, I think as I go around the country and hear what not just HR directors, but medical directors and chief execs are saying, I think I'm um, understanding needs, uh, looking to influence at the highest level. And pretty much all of the relationships that I have are at board level. Um, either uh, the chief exec, the HR director in the main, or maybe medical director. And that's really helpful in terms of engaging with uh, decision makers. Uh, and that's pushing me uh, to my uh, outcome focus and extroversion um, aspects. Uh, Recognising the value of working in partnership. Um, well, I'll invite Amory back up in a moment. <laughs> and uh, we certainly would say I think we have a very strong partnership as we do this together. And thinking outside the box, lots of, um, you know, I've showed you quite a number of images here of some of the things that um, we're doing to build relationships and uh, to introduce Lumina as a tool and, and concept for the NHS. So uh, I'm, I've tried to leave some time at the end for any questions that anyone might have. And if, if Anne-Marie could rejoin me. Things to add. Yes, yeah, it's always sure. um, yeah. good to hear what I see. Yeah. Um, I see somebody who's very bold. Um, the event in the House of Lords has only happened because you put it together and you contact people, CEOs across the country, not just the NHS, and uh, and you get them to to go. And you're very bold in what you do. Um, you're also a musician, which you will see tonight. Um, and perhaps that helps in terms of um, you go with the flow as well. You're very, very good at listening. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute, absolute joy to, to work with you. But there's some other, other things about you that you bring. You're very human, as you can probably hear, um, that you, you brought to this, this piece of work. So, um, so you, yeah. you, you can't tell, but I'm, I'm blushing here. <laughs> 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 yeah, so he's also got a sense of humour as well, which helps a lot. <laughs> and you're just always there, you know, so I'm, I'm very aware how busy you are, and every time I ring, you take the phone, and, and we probably speak, speak weekly as well. So you've been very willing to just open up for what you do, and, um, and I guess it really is an invitation for other practitioners to, um, to really think very conceptually about what you can do and... and and contact us, like, like Clive did. Sometimes it's not us contacting you, but you contact us and say, you got an idea, and just push us uh, to go beyond what we normally do, because you've certainly pushed us, pushed me, um, which has been really good. Right, so questions. Clive, you teased us really early on by saying you can fix problems uh, in a one-day workshop, but then didn't tell us how you fix them. Uh, can you, oh. you, you said power, rights, and interests, and interests were by far the, the most important. What do you actually do to fix a problem in a day? Yeah, so the way the process works is um, there's some pre-work. So uh, if I just talk about the most recent case, all of the neurosurgeons yesterday, I spoke to each of them by phone ahead of yesterday, and sometimes that's half an hour maybe, an hour for me to get an understanding of what the issues are and critically what they see as a good outcome. What is it that they want as a result of the day? And then on the day itself, um, we get them talking. I get them talking as uh, quickly as possible. 
and normally for most, that conversation should have taken place years uh, before. So now they've got an opportunity to say what's on their mind to their colleagues. Uh, the morning, maybe early afternoon, I would describe as messy. There were, um, uh, I've mentioned how many people were in the room yesterday, and there were a couple of surgeons uh, um, who were indicating to me, you know, they were doing this sign. And they were doing that because there was one surgeon in particular who was very, uh, very articulate in putting his point of view across. And, you know, sometimes that was quite painful for them. So lots of um, putting stuff on the table. And then once that's been done, it's, well, the, the, so what? What do you see as an outcome? And then trying to get colleagues working together on getting those conclusions. And that's then put into a, a document, um, which is normally a one-page document. Um, that they can take away. And then uh, th there's normally a follow-up that's required. So in this case, uh, there's a follow-up about how um, cranial and spine will be able to work and increase in bed capacity, for example, and my role will be to go back and help the surgeons to work that through because they can't do it on their own. If they do it on their own, they'll fall out again. So they need someone neutral who can go in and help them do that. So I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a clinician. I understand how the mechanics of health works and I can just facilitate conversations. And when people have a chance to speak, all of us as human beings, wherever we are from on the planet, want to be heard and listened to. And if that isn't given, problems normally escalate. And that's why I have the job that I do, is to give the forum where people can be heard. And it takes a day. Thank you for the excellent lecture. Um, I am a doctor. I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician and a director of a hospital. And uh, I would say like this. We face such conflicts and disputes on a daily basis. And I think the real problem is that uh, the director, medical directors, directors of hospitals, the chairman of the departments, did not get any tools, any training, yeah. how to deal with it. Yeah. Instead of outsourcing this dispute resolution, we need to do it ourselves. The way I think it should be done is to train, as part of their recruitment to these senior positions as medical directors, to get minimal tools, flomina, tools to help them to mediate and to, to solve these problems. So did you think about uh, an offer, which means as part of their training, medical directors, consultants, they have to get not just clinical tools, but also decision-making tools, yeah, yeah. lumina tools. I think it may help them because they cannot do it on an outsourcing basis every time. We need the 24 hours. My my role as a director of a hospital, 20, maybe 99% solve these uh, yeah. disputes, yeah. not dealing with the patients. And I think it's very time consuming because uh, not all of them uh, are familiar with these tools. I am yes because I learned Lomina and I believe in Lomina. Maybe this will be uh, yeah. my suggestion yeah. to offer yeah. to the NHS, other health system in the world. It will help. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I hope we can make some progress along those lines. I would say a few things. Um, uh, consultants and surgeons are, as Louise, I think, mentioned, very high on the, the red spectrum. Probably the most bizarre example I can give of how a surgeon might choose to uh, deal with their colleague is of a case earlier this year where, in theater, uh, someone was speaking to a surgeon, the surgeon didn't like what they were saying, and he physically took some bandages and put it around this person's heads to stop them from, from speaking. I mean, just really bizarre be uh, behavior. Um, in, in the research, it shows that those who are appointed from, part of the problem in um, health is that an excellent consultant can then be promoted to become what's called a clinical lead, so they have team management responsibilities, but they're not equipped with line management training, with line management skills when that happens, and that happened in about 17.5% uh, of the cases that I was, um, that I was looking at. Um, without a doubt, being able to equip them uh, with Lumina, 
um, I'd highly recommend, as, as, as we do with trying to run in-house mediation skills training, for example, so it can be managed um, in-house. The final thing I would say is um, I don't mediate um, alone, so I have no power as a mediator. So there will always be in the room, as there was yesterday, either the medical director or the clinical lead who can make a decision on behalf of the trust about you know, whether they can change bed space, theater utilization, uh, looking at job plans, all those kinds of things. So my role is to make sure that I can get the right people in the room so that we can make those decisions and not waste, uh, waste that day of, of time. Um, I just recently read the book The Chimp Paradox by Professor Steve Peters, who I thought was interesting that he is the Dean of the School of Medicine at Sheffield University. So do you think there's any scope to get doctors to understand you know, what's going on in their brains and how you get this kind of impairment in the frontal cortex and sort of all the executive functions? You'd have thought yeah. doctors could engage with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And um, sometimes I'll talk about what's happening in the, in the brain from a neuroscience point of view, and doctors are open to listening to it. They're not saying that they're beyond education themselves. But what you say is absolutely right. What happens in the cortex, um, the prefrontal cortex, and how that impairs executive function when someone's in um, some conflict and tension. But they're, they're certainly open to, to that thinking. I think we're, we're almost time. Oh, we yeah. can't yeah. point you out anymore. Should, should, should we take this one, the, yeah. one last, last okay. question? Yeah. Thanks, Clive. Yeah. Um, I work for an organisation that has a number of um, internal qualified mediators, myself yeah. being one of them, and we're looking to roll out our internal mediation service to the rest of the organisation. So mine's quite a practical question in terms of, do you see Lumina having a place within the mediation process itself? And if so, where do you think that would occur? Would it be part of the, the pre-work or as part of the, the one-day sort of mediation session itself? Mm. It would be part of the one-day session. Um, so I tried this for the first time on Friday when I was with the obstetricians and midwives pr primarily. Uh, just an hour at introducing the tool, uh, running portraits and... What's useful about that is it gets people talking because people are fascinated by looking at the portrait. And so it's great news for someone who does what I do because it oils the wheels for conversation. You know, oxytocin levels go up. And um, what I found on Friday was that they were much more willing to have the more difficult conversation that, that followed. So, yeah, ab absolutely. Maybe not all the time, but for some cases. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you.